Hello everybody, it's James here and the man with the magnificent moustache is of course Dutch Mantel with a cigar in his mouth and I am James and before we carry on, let's do some plugs. I've got two books, Owen Hart, King of Pranks. If you get it now, you can get it for Christmas and also Dwayne The Rock Johnson, the people's champion, straight biography of The Rock as well. You can get it for Christmas, they're selling like hotcakes and Dutch, you've got two books as well. I do, I have two books and if you, and these are old, old time stories. It uh, stays with the theme of the, uh, the podcast, uh, Stories by Dutch. And uh, these are just old-time stories that I learned in the back of cars or driving a car and years and years and years ago. And unless these stories are told and written down, they'll just be lost. Here's the world according to Dutch. And this is the uh, Tales from a Dirt Road. And these are old stories, some of them 30, 40, 50 years old. And I guarantee you, you've never heard them because I just actually brought them back out. But anyway, uh, you can write me at Dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's at gmail.com. And I'll get back uh, in touch with you about uh, to get these books autographed. I mean, you can buy them off Amazon, too, but they're not autographed. But if you want them autograph, personally autograph to you or a friend or your dad or whoever, contact me and we'll get it to them. Great gift, great gift, a gift, especially at Christmas. Ah, I like how it's a slight slip of the, a great grift. <laughs> you did say very, very good. Gr- yeah, great grift. So, <laughs> uh, what's going on with you? What's going on with you? I'm cold. Uh, I actually looked at the Fahrenheit. Uh, it's it's l- below twenty. It's not below twenty. It's it's nineteen something Fahrenheit over here at the moment. That's why I'm wearing my winter finery today. I'm freezing. Well, today I'm going to report that it's like seventy two. Jeez. Uh. Sunny, and I can I can't see the beach from here, but it's like fifteen minutes away, so I could get down there, but. And that's the uh, one of the advantages of living in Florida. Mm. Uh, so no seasonal affective disorder for you then? Well, Florida has like five days of winter. I mean, if you can suffer through that, you can get through it. Now, now last year, it was a little bit longer. It was like 10 days. But to people, when it gets down to like 50 degrees, 40, they're going, oh, my God. Oh, it's, I'm freezing to death. Because you get in Florida and you get acclimated to the climate, uh, climate, and when it gets cold like that, it, it, it bothers people. But I'm, I'm glad I moved down here because I do enjoy the weather. With uh, with free, I've got some relatives in Canada. I remember them saying when it was freezing, uh, I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, but it's zero Celsius. Yeah. And they just went, hey, dude, that's, that's T-shirt weather up here, man, when it's freezing. No kidding. And I don't really, I don't know how people make it in Canada. Uh, but again... You let you get acclimated to it, and sometimes it doesn't bother you that bad. Then you would go to Florida, then you would just sweat all the time. Mm. But I'd rather be sweating and kind of warmish than not sweating and freezing to death anytime. Have I told you where I'm going first week in January? Uh, no, because you don't tell me anything. You kayfabe me on everything. <laughs> I'm not kayfabe. Oh, all right, I'll tell you. I'm going to Norway. So if I thought I was freezing my balls off now, then this is going to be some serious cold coming in a couple of weeks. How, how cold would that bit get? Uh, however cold it is here, knock off another five. In Fahrenheit, it's going to be zero probably. Well, that's why they ski and ice skate there. Mm. And uh, that's why uh, That's why uh, for next year I'm going to be booking the holidays. Jesus. But I heard, Norway, I heard Norway was beautiful. I've never been. I, I, you can see the Northern Lights there, but apart from that, I don't know anything really apart from they're all incredibly tall and called Bjorn. So you, so you can see the Northern Lights? From there, yeah. I've always wanted to see that. I've never been that far, far north. I've always tried to keep myself south between like the, you know, the equator and Florida. I like to stay in somewhere in there, so I'm okay. Man, it's going to be another four months until I can wear shorts again. It sucks. I, I've moaned about the weather, but uh, I'm going to stop moaning about the weather, and I'm going to invite you, Dutch, to comment on some news stories that we've uh, been seeing got, through these last couple of weeks. Oh, let me let me say, I have Jack Swagger, hmm. my old-time, uh, I used to manage him in WWE, 
and I texted him this morning and asked him would he uh, be so kind as to do our podcast. He said, hell yeah, I'll do it. Because with Jack, and I told him this morning, I says, you know, my whole time in the wrestling business, I've never really had more fun than I did with Jack on the road. Hmm. Great guy to travel with, funny, listen to all my bullshit. Dr- his greatest attribute is he was uh, he drove all the time. He was a horrible driver, <laughs> but at least he didn't want me to drive. But and he took us everywhere, and and I, I really enjoyed my time with him there. So so maybe not next week, but the week after, we will have Mister Swagger as a special guest. I'm looking forward to that as well. We had shall I, shall I not mention who our original intended special guest was, just in case they pull out again, or what do you think? Go ahead. No. I- Go ahead. Oh, okay, right. So we were going to have Road Dog on, but um, with WWE commitments, uh, as you can imagine, especially in the run to Christmas, he got a bit uh, bogged down with work. So hopefully we'll have him on January. We'll have Jack, uh, well, Jake Hager now uh, on in a couple of weeks or whenever we can um, sort of align all our schedules. Uh, one other thing I forgot is if you enjoy this podcast, uh, give us five stars on iTunes. One other thing I want to mention is Jack Swagger, Jake Hager. What was his relationship with Danny Hodge? Did he actually train him, or was he just from the same area? No. Same area. Danny Hodge was a legend in Oklahoma and North Texas, and and Jack was in the uh, NCAA finals, I think. I don't know if he won or not, but great amateur wrestler. I, I Actually, great football player, too. He set a record in Oklahoma for seven blocked uh, – what they call PATs, points after touchdowns, you know, when they kick it after the touchdown. And that was just in wrestling. <laughs> think how well he did on the gridiron, man. Oh, yeah. I just think, how, you know, he was great on that too. But, you know, uh, he, he knew Hodge through uh, JR, Jim Ross. He knew him and through there. And, uh, and Hodge was a great guy. I shook his hand one time, and he was noted for the hand grip – if you shook his hand and he wanted to, he could drop you to the floor, which he did me one night because I'm laughing. Oh, yeah, you got the hand grip. Oh, yeah. And he he, he showered down on it, and I dropped. And I was saying, please, please, please. And he was laughing. Everybody else was laughing too because I never shook his hand before. That was his deal. When he shook somebody's, if you were new to him and he shook your hand, brother, he, he, would, he, would, he would put the pressure on it. And he used to do a thing. He would take an apple on an interview on a wrestling show and he'd start squeezing it to the juice would run out of the apple and down his arm. That's a pretty strong grip, buddy. And great wrestler. And I don't know. He, I don't know. He wasn't undefeated, but he, he had a, like an unbelievable record, like two losses in his whole collegiate career, which is, which is unbelievable. And a good guy too. Yeah, I think he had a very good boxing career as well. I mean, well, I mean uh, record, maybe something like 11 on, and 2 or something like that before he dedicated full-time to pro. Uh, there's a story in Jim Ross's book about Danny Hodge, which I really like, is that, as you, uh, I'm sure, will know far better than I will, is that the rookies drove and the veterans didn't. And that was sort of uh, your part <laughs> of uh, a <laughs> sort of part of, uh, that's why Jack Swagger, I'm sure, did the driving. But yes. um, one day, Jim Ross was complaining about how tired he was, and Danny Hodge said, don't worry about it, I'll drive. And then as soon as uh, Jim starts shutting his eyes a bit, Danny Hodge pretends to be asleep and then runs the car off the road just to just to scare him. Oh, I believe that. You know, he's over there like, oh, I'm so tired. Well, welcome to the business. Boom. <laughs> and he probably didn't wreck it, but he probably, you know, he hit the side where he start bouncing around and, you know, or hit the brakes and, and I bet after a while, Jim didn't even close his eyes because he didn't know what Danny was going to do. Danny was just as dangerous playing around as he thought he was by not playing around. But but Jim should have been driving that car anyway. I he think, was a rookie. Yeah, exactly. He was a rookie. And he uh, apparently it happened to him twice. And then I can't remember if it was Danny Hodge who did it first or <laughs> whoever else did it first. But someone else went, oh, the other guy got you first. But by, all right, never mind. So apparently that was just a, a, a quite a common rib that happened at the time. Oh, and an easy one, too. See, if we'd have had cameras in those days, we'd have all kind of footage. I don't know how much we could have shown of it, but 
I wish we'd had cameras back in those days. Yeah, definitely. All those little GoPros or whatever in the corners of the car to capture everything that went on. Um, right, for uh, our new show, I'm going to crack on. And we've got, you know you know me, I send you these scripts like Gone with the Wind, you know how long they all are. So we'll get through as much as we can. And but then, today, uh, was it, today was it that long, though? Oh, well, the news one's three pages. The uh, uh, question one is less than two. And you were appreciating some of the questions in that as well. But for now, we will uh, leave it with this. And first thing we'll say is best wishes to Barry Wyndham, who recently had a heart attack. Uh, Bray Wyatt gave further information. I'd love to read it, but the light's very dim here. Um, this week, my uncle Barry Wyndham had a massive heart failure, uh, heart attack, heart failure in Atlanta, and he went down and he didn't have a pulse for 10 or 20 minutes. And a random citizen saw him go down and gave him CPR for something like 10 to 20 minutes, kept his heart beating, and that's why he's still alive. So, uh, Barry Wyndham, uh, thoughts? Lucky, lucky. Now, I don't know if I believe the 10 to 20 minutes without a heartbeat. Usually that signifies you're dead. But he probably had a heartbeat. Let's shorten that down because a wrestler is telling the story. And it probably looked really, really bad for a while. I'll say five minutes. But, you know, five could seem like an hour sometimes if, if it's a, a critical situation. And this was. So if he was walking around the Atlanta airport and he went down, you know, You've never been in the Atlanta airport, right? No, no. Oh, uh, it's, JFK. it's, it's, I mean, they have actually big, big corridors too, leading to the gates and it's packed, especially in, in the mornings. So if he went down, there'd be a lot of people around trying to revive him. I think the guy that stayed with him was a, uh, a paramedic. I think he may have been, yeah. He was called Michael Todd uh, Lalick, uh, but he just happened to be there, saw him go down. I don't know if w- what Bray means by he didn't have a pulse for 10, 20 minutes. Maybe he means that his heart wasn't beating on its own for 10 to 20 minutes, and that's why CPR had to be administered for that long. But um, uh, a uh, uh, sort of a, a mutual friend uh, told me that Barry was uh, talking, chatting, saying he was okay a day or two afterwards. Not okay, but, you know, mm-hmm. uh, he was still in the ICU well, at that time. Well, he's lucky. Bear is a great guy. I love him to death. And if he was walking through the airport and went down, that could happen to anybody. Hope it doesn't happen to me, but it could. Don't go to and Atlanta I'm, airport, I'm, then. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, hey, I've seen people stretched out there. They'll, they'll bring that gurney in. They'll load them up at that door. So they probably didn't load him up because they didn't know what kind of condition he was in. And that could be caused by age, I guess, or extra weight or a lot of things. How old is Barry? He's in his 60s He's in now, his 60s, right? yeah. I can look that up in a second. Did you ever wrestle Barry? Yeah, a time or two. Hmm. Not much. Oh, great. You know, he was a big guy. He was like 6'5". Hmm. He's probably, two, in those days, 240, maybe even more. But, and he was fluid. To be so big and so kind of tall to me, 6'4 is tall to me because I'm nowhere close to 6'4. But uh, for him to be so fluid and be so big was just amazing to watch. I even watch him now and say, wow, that's, that's just, it's just fluid work. Because he came from a wrestling family. So, that may have come naturally to him anyway. Is he one of those guys like Bob Orton Jr. or Ricky Steamboat that almost makes it look too easy because they're just that good? Almost. They make it look like no effort is required. They're that good. I mean, they all throw good punches. But Orton, he was he was great from a wrestling family. Steamboat from a wrestling family. So, and they do make it look a lot easier than it really is. That's why I think sometimes fans out there say, wow, I could do that. Oh, shit. I've seen people get in the ring and try to wrestle, and they take the first little, they call them bumps, the first little fall. They said, I can't do this. I can't do it. Because how many of those is in a normal match? 20, 30? 
and taking the turnbuckles and the ropes and over the tops and this and that and the other and drop kicks and landing. It takes a lot of talent to be a pro wrestler and make it look good. It's like stunt men done with one take because there's no second takes. If you screw it up, it's just screwed up. You might try to fix it down the road or do something, take their minds off of it. But once you screw it up, it's screwed up. You don't get a second take on it. You ever watch stunt men plan their balls? It's meticulous. It takes, them to, it takes them two or three days. And they'll get up there and they'll look and they'll check the wind and they'll do this. A wrestler doesn't have time to go up there and get a weather report. <laughs> I mean, he said, okay, I'm going to do this. Boom. And he does it. Of course, a lot of wrestlers in doing that, they may plant it in the back, but a lot of times it's just called spur of the moment because they're checking the temperature of the room, see what the people are responding to. And it's like a comedian going on stage, and there is an interconnection between all these, all these things I'm mentioning. But a comedian will go on there and he hit one little joke, see what kind of response he gets. Then he hits another one, see what kind of response he hits. And then he'll zero in on it because he's got several different ways to, to go at an audience. Same way with a wrestler. A wrestler, when you go in a ring, first thing I heard is because they didn't use the terms like check the temperature of the room. They said, listen to the people. Same thing. Listen to see what they're buying. If they're not buying this, then do something else. Because if you stay with it, it will be a stinker. So, but that's how it's done. Yeah, in the next episode, I've got a, a video. Well, actually, I say I've got it. You told you tagged me in this video, so we'll we'll watch it. Somebody who was <laughs> not listening to the temperature of the room, but that's for the next episode. Uh, next bit of news: Conan is back on dialysis and looking for a second kidney donor after his first donated kidney has started to fail again. Well, I hate that for him because I remember when he had a had bad kidney before we were in TNA, and Conan's kind of mad at me right now because I mentioned the time he sued me. And then I just let it go because I think the people kind of know the truth about it anyway. But I do wish him luck in getting a new kidney. I mean, you, you can get over being mad at somebody or being upset with somebody. Getting over a kidney transplant is not easy. And he's already had one. And I think he had that 15 years ago. Does it say when he had the, the last kidney transplant. Yeah, no, it was maybe about a dozen years ago, something like that, yeah. I think it was in TNA or about that time. And uh, he was, and I don't know who he got to, to be his donor, but Conan, Carlos, much success to you and hope you, uh, you get better and you get well and get back out and walking around because wrestling business kind of needs you because they like to listen to your, <laughs> your take on certain things and I do too and I actually like Conan but uh, I wish him a lot of success and a lot of luck Yeah, uh, just before we uh, get off Conan I, I think he's still working remotely uh, like booking for AAA at the moment but also wh when did Conan's health problems start because he seems to have been struggling for quite a number of years with various ailments well I know it was at least 15 years ago at least and I don't so he only has one kidney now, correct? I think he's got one. I don't know if he's got one that failed ages ago and the other one's failing now. I, I, I don't know. I don't know either. No. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll leave. Uh... We, we, would make, we would make great reporters. <laughs> say, well, we don't know. We, we, just, we just heard this and we're going to go with it. So. Those are like Conan Kidney, riff on it for two minutes. All right, we'll move on. Uh, Kurt Angle's 54th <laughs> birthday. Uh, on the 9th of December, it was on SmackDown. You watched SmackDown. It was celebrated, and Angle sprayed Gable and Otis with the hose from a milk truck in homage to the first time he did that in 2001 when he was doing the WCW, uh, ECW Alliance sort of thing versus the WWF. So what do you think of the segment? Oh, I like the segment. I like Kurt anyway. But Kurt, he he just listened, and it was more of a it was more of a thing for Gable to get over than Kurt. And Kurt let him go through all this stuff, which he which was that was the way it was laid out. Then he brought in the milk truck, and then he sprayed them down. And I was thinking at the time, I didn't know he did that on his anniversary when he, I mean that was the anniversary he did that. 
Or did he do that? Who, who did the? I thought Austin did the beer. Yeah, Austin did the beer. Kurt Angle did the milk truck. That was something like 21 years ago. Okay. But I thought it was actually pretty good. I enjoyed that. And actually, SmackDown, and I was reading, and of course, I review SmackDown every week for Sports Kita on Facebook. And uh, you can tune in to watch that on Friday nights at 11 o'clock uh, p.m. It's late. But that's when the rampage goes off on the East Coast. So I watch two hours of SmackDown. Then I watch two hours of Rampage. Then we go live with a podcast on Facebook, and we talk about both shows. So I, mean, I was reading about, and you may read this a little later, about uh, the Raw's numbers being down. But SmackDown is actually being up and steady and, and increasing. SmackDown's got a, good, a pretty decent show now. There is so much difference now between the time that Vince left and Triple H took over. Oh, it's night and day. Because you would need a no-dose pills to watch SmackDown before. And you'd be sitting there and go, <laughs> you think Danny Hodge driving the car and you're running off. Oh, God, oh, God. <laughs> but you know, SmackDown's a good show now. And they're kind of they're kind of starting to lay out their long-term stories. And that's what always set Raw apart from, you know, just regular regional uh, shows that they replace, the territory shows, because they would, they would take you out of the studio and they'd have a little vignettes of these guys and they're coming or whatever, but it would keep you tuned into the show. SmackDown tried to do it last week with the, uh, with the Bray Wyatt or the Uncle Howdy and the L.A. Night segment, but they only showed two segments of it. You know, you was expecting a third segment that you didn't get. So now I'm going to watch SmackDown this week to see that third segment to see how they wrapped it up. I think with the Bray Wyatt thing, people have sort of figured out that uh, Bray's true value is not in wrestling, but it's actually in the sort of build-up to the match rather than the match itself. So they're just oh, yeah. stringing you along as much as possible. Interesting character. I would think with the with the Uncle Howdy thing, and I may have said this before on this show, one of them, I think they should go in with the lie detector test and hook him up and ask him, is he Uncle Howdy? Of course, he's going to say no, and the deal is they're going to look at each other and say, he's telling the truth. So now, is he Uncle Howdy? Or is he not? Or is he just so sociologically impaired that he can't tell the difference? See, Bray, I'm sure the time that he's been off, he's added all these layers in. And he's a pretty good storyteller. Because it's got my attention. I, I, like, I like that story. I will talk about ratings in a bit, though. But something else is Matt Riddle has been written off television courtesy of Solo Sokoa and said he'd suffered a uh, trachea damage and would be out for six weeks. But it's just come out now that the real reason he's gone is because he failed the wellness policy from before SummerSlam. We don't know why he failed the, uh, failed the wellness policy, but this is his second time. He's been told he has to go to rehab or be released, so he's obviously chosen rehab. Uh, but all of that, all of that together, uh, uh, what do you think of it? Okay, when he goes to rehab, he has to stay there. I imagine so, yeah. Yeah, it's like a, a hotel that you're not that welcome to leave. Ooh. Well, I don't know. It's sad. But this, this could actually be pain pills. It could be a lot of things that he is not prescribed to be taking. I don't know what it was. And you just mentioned you don't know what it was that they, he failed the, failed the wellness policy. But this is the second time he's failed it? Yes. So um, in, the old, in the old days, it used to be uh, 30 days for a first suspension, 60 days for a second suspension or rehab, and the third time you're out. And it might still be a third time and you're out. But that also always depends on how big of a superstar fails. Well, it also, in the old system... When I was there the first time, 
it wasn't really a system. It was just, it was just like, we're going to pretend that we're kind of drug testing and we're going to, re- you know, those figures can say anything. It's whatever he wants to put down on it. And it's whatever Vince told him to put down. And it's, of course, he would fail a couple of guys like underneath preliminary guys just to make, just to make it look like, you know, they're, it's a straight up system, which it wasn't. I mean, all those top guys were all doing something. They have to do something. And people say, well, what, what were those guys taking drugs? Listen, they're flying every day somewhere and they're going and that flying sounds exotic and exciting till you do it. You take a four hour flight from New York or Atlanta to Denver or whatever. Then you get off. And first thing you do, you, you go get you a car and you go find a room, try to get a couple hours sleep. But some guys would go and get the room, then go to the gym, then come back to the room, maybe try to rest an hour, then to the building. And then they'd wrestle their, be there all night. Then they would leave, either go back to the hotel or to the next town, wherever they got to go. And some of those days were like 16 hour days. So for them to handle it, their body to handle it, you know, they would have to take something to get them rest. But of course, some things were banned. You couldn't take this, you couldn't take that. And, and if you got hurt on the road, well, back in those days, unless you worked, you didn't get paid. They didn't have those those contracts like they got now. If if they don't book you, you still get paid, which is a great deal, by the way. Hmm. So, but so it was in their best interest financially to not get hurt. And if they do get hurt, they got to work through the pain. And that is one way a lot of guys learned to work because they're working favoring a leg. Their work favoring a shoulder or a neck. So they got to work around it, which made them search and seek other ways to do the same stuff without taking a lot of unnecessary bumps. And that's how you really learn to work. See, back when I started, we was working sometimes seven days a week and a double header on Sunday plus a TV in the week. So that was what, that was 10 times a week Mm -hmm. that you would actually wrestle. If you told a guy to work 10 times a week, now they'd look at you and say, ain't no way I'm doing that. And they don't, because they don't book it that way anymore. The guys, they have to have some, some time to, to rest and to, to, you know, to let their body recover from all the, all the aches and pains of, just traveling around. I mean, traveling around with, with that type of uh, schedule, whether you're wrestling or not, is very tiring. So, but, and I hated, I hated when they called, you know, you got to get drug tested today in rooms, wherever, whatever building you're in. Uh, did, um, did you get drug, this might be a weird question, but did you get drug tested during the Zeb Coulter run or did you have a different type of like non-performers contract where they didn't bother? No, I think I did get tested. Really? I think I did. Not much. I mean, what am I going to be taking? Steroids? Geritol? <laughs> Geritol or something? I don't know. But I'm, I'm trying to think of the guy, Bam Bam Bigelow. Mm. So this was the days that the grass, I mean, you couldn't smoke weed. And somebody in the office would leak the date of the next drug test. So Madison Square Garden was on a Sunday, but on a Saturday night, they ran a town, say, 100 miles from New York City, and they drug tested there. Well, Bam Bam, he'd been off the weed for a while, expecting the drug test to come, and there it was. And he expected it in Madison Square Garden, but it wasn't. It was in this little spot show, they call it spot shows, before the big show at the garden. So he went in there and he was happy as hell because he was clean. But on the way back, he said, shit, they've already drug tested. He hit him a doobie, or two doobies on the way home. 
And then he went down to the garden the next day. He did a doobie on the way down there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he got in there, and the first thing he saw was drug test today. <laughs> of course, he failed it. They outsmarted him. But what it did was he couldn't work for a month, which, mean, which meant that his opponent would get the consequences of that because he, he had an angle with Bam Bam. So Bam Bam, he told him this. He said, listen, I know why I'm not getting paid. He said, why don't we do this? And I forgot who we was working with. Why don't you let me go ahead and just continue this angle with so-and-so? Because no need for him to suffer because I got, I got busted. And he agreed to work for nothing as long as his opponent could work too and get paid. It was actually pretty good on Bam Bam's part, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And and I don't know how long he was he was out. I don't think it was. I think it was thirty days. I think they the order of the court, Vince's court, they may have cut it down to three weeks. But I actually, I thought that was pretty good on Bam Bam's part that he would work for nothing so the other guy could get paid. Uh, one more thing about these tests is I've heard I've actually heard from UFC as well. It's famously Brock Lesnar and Mark Hunt why Mark Hunt sued UFC is because uh, picking and choosing when they bother suspending somebody. And this is four months between the actual wellness policy violation and then Riddle being written off TV. Mm -hmm. So what do you think of WWE sort of suspending people on their terms so it doesn't affect storylines? Is there a moral well, issue there? Well, four months ago, that was when the deal with Vince was breaking. I think they were tied up with that more than they were tied up with drug testing. And I think that that took up maybe most of their administrative time. And I think when they got back around to it, they said, Oh yeah, we didn't, we didn't touch this back when it happened. So we have to do it now. And they didn't have to do it. I mean, I don't know what oversight they have over the, the results of drug testing. I don't even know who looks at that. I guess Medical, I guess. I don't know. It's, it's, I think they bring but, in a third party uh, a team of doctors and medical personnel to deal with all this. Well, maybe. But I think that was probably, that was the delay part of it. That they had so much on their plate then, they, would, they had to deal with the most pressing issue, which was, which was Vince's, Vince was leaving, and they would get to riddle a little bit later. Mm. It's nice that they've given Riddle six weeks off over Christmas as well, so that's uh, something for him, I suppose. Um, yeah, but he's going. He's going into rehab. Yeah, when's he going into rehab? Oh, when's he going into rehab? It must be. It must be straight away, I suppose. I don't know. I don't know. Um, it, but maybe it'd be a day release thing. Maybe he's holed up somewhere for six weeks. Who knows? Yeah, but if he's holed up somewhere, he's away from his family at Christmas. I mean, they can come see him. I mm. guess. I don't know. It could even be like a WWE-approved rehab 500 miles away from where he lives. Who knows, I suppose. Well, they could send him to Florida. You know, I was, I was just thinking the other day, anybody who has worked for WWE can at any time declare themselves uh, their, their, their wants or, or they want to go to a, a drug clinic. And WWE will pick it up. No questions asked, I guess. So so if I was in Canada, you mentioned Canada and I code it, it's going to get if I was in Canada, I'd have a drug relapse like every January. <laughs> and I'd go to Florida for six weeks, you know, between January and the middle of February, and get myself whole again. And I would have a whole year to see if I could stay off the that notorious weed or the notorious opioids or whatever that was plaguing me. You should have, because you're in Florida, uh, a, like a, a Tampa-based rehab facility for cold wrestlers. In my house. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah well, maybe next door or something. And you have like a cold wrestlers rehab for every January and get it on WWE's dime. Yeah, that's what I should do. And I would just go over there and check on them like every other day or something. Like if Riddle was there, I said, where's Riddle? They said, oh, he's, he left last night and said he'd be back sometime He's at the dispensary. 
<laughs> he's down to some drugstore <laughs> trying to sign a bunch of blank scripts. So, <laughs> but, but a lot of, I've, I've, I've heard of several guys going into rehab and WWE picks it up. Rehab is very, very expensive. You know, a, a week in rehab, you know what it cost? Tell me. Our 10 grand. $10,000 to lay around the uh, infirmary, I guess. I guess they got bad. You live there. But it's like $10,000. $10, and, of course, the WWE is going to pay for it. They just pay for it. I don't think their insurance pays for it anything. I think they pay for it. So people who have a medical background said, hey, I tell you what, I'm going to start. I'm going to start me a rehab center. And they were scams going on. One guy would go around, and these aren't wrestlers. These are just people. And he would recruit addicts to go to uh, the halfway house or the, the rehab center. And he could only do it once a year, and he had a list. They've, they've, cut, they've smartened up to it now. And he did this for like four or five years before they caught on to it. But, and he would tell them he would give them, say, $2,000 when they signed to go in, knowing he was going to make like 30000 on it. And, you know, a broke addict on the street don't have any money. You give me, what, $2,000? Hell yeah, I'll sign it. Let's go. They put them in there and they feed them. And, of course, they don't give them the drugs, but it's according to how bad they're addicted, whether they need them or not. But, but it became a scam. So, so if, I don't, if I disappear... All of a sudden, you say, where's Dutch? Well, I think he's in that Sunshine Center rehab <laughs> <laughs> down in Orlando. <laughs> so I, th I think he's there, so you can, you can find him there. So now you know where I might end up. Absolutely. Fine. Fine business idea. It's, it's more than I can possibly give you for this podcast anyway. So it'd be financially, <laughs> financially more of a boon to you. Uh, we are going to move on news-wise, and this is probably the biggest news i actually watched the vince mcmahon the nine lives of vince mcmahon uh that vice did and it was essentially just a the some of the greatest hits from dark side of the ring and then a few extra talking heads on it like Meltzer or alvarez or vince russo that kind of thing um but the wall street journal has claimed i think this is two days ago as we record this that vince has been hit with two more civil suits from women who alleged that he has in uh, some way interfered with them uh, and of course, one of them is Rita Chatterton, the former WWF yep. referee. She has asked her lawyer to in, uh, to uh, ask uh, WWE for eleven point seven five million dollars in damages relating to the alleged incident where McMahon forced himself upon her in the back of a limo in New York City in 1986. And the second woman uh, is unnamed. She was a manager of a five star resort spa in Southern California. The manager reported. Excuse me. The alleged assault to her superiors at the time, and as per the Wall Street Journal, this is the quote: "The spa manager reported the alleged assault at the time to the resort, according to people familiar with the matter. The spa manager also told her husband about the incident. Some of these people said he drove to the WWE event with a baseball bat and tried to confront Mr. McMahon, but was turned away, according to these people. The woman's lawyer, Michael Bressler, has been in touch with Mr. McMahon's attorney since at least July, according to people familiar with discussions. Now, Vince has also claimed." Or people have claimed that Vince McMahon has told people close to him that he will uh, absolutely not be paying either of these women. Well, <clears throat> you see a prime example of money grab. They have seen what he's paid out in the last few months. But th those were instances that were three or four years ago. Chatterton has been, what, 30-something years more? 36, in fact. 36 years ago, she's and I thought that case was settled. No, uh, I'm actually going to read this out as well. So, uh, per uh, WSJ New York, recently opened a one-year window that allows victims to file sex abuse lawsuits based on decades-old claims, and California also has a new law that allows alleged victims of sex abuse to file lawsuits that would otherwise be turned, uh, sorry, bar barred by the statute of limitations. Starting in January, victims will have a one-year window to file such claims. It's still a money grab because the lawyers or these women to get with these lawyers and they're always figuring out little holes in the law or whatever. What they're looking for 
is they don't want to go to court. Let's don't do that. They're looking for a settlement. So Chatterton may be looking for a million dollars. If she gets that, she'd be happy. I'd be happy too. All of a sudden, you're sitting around, oh, here's a chance to make me $650,000 on a million dollar settlement, and you give the attorney 30% or whatever you give him, the other woman too. So, but that is odd, but it's still a money grab because <clears throat> they know Vince has got the money to pay and will probably pay. But they also brought out that he is coming back to WWE. Was that your next point you're going to make? Um, well, uh, just before I do, uh, I was going to make mention of it was something around 2005, and I'm sure you'll remember this news story where apparently Vince McMahon exposed himself in a tanning salon and maybe tried to grope or grab uh, a lady who worked there. And I remember reading at the time, so I must have been 19 or whatever it was, I was just thinking, that's such a money grab. That's so never happened. Da, 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 da. And that only in 2022, and I'm sure a lot of other people thought that as well, only in 2022 did the sort of all these accusations finally sort of collide and sort of paint a fairly obvious picture. Although we don't know if that happened or not, of course. But Well, we could have a case here of a serial sex offender, Vince being one of them. Because how many times has he been accused of this? I know at least 10 times, I think. And then you, you hear the stories. I was in WWE. You hear the stories from the girls. <clears throat> and they're saying this happened. Of course, I have no way of knowing or not whether it happened or not but I don't know why the girls would just be spreading that around for no reason. Seemed like that would be detrimental to them actually working there, spreading rumors about uh, Vince doing this or somebody in the, in the office doing it to them. I, I don't know, but I think the thing in about 2005, you said, yeah, the, had, yeah, the tan, the, tan, tan I, bad one. Yeah. I think that was in Florida. Is that where it was? I, yeah, I believe so. So, and this is, might be another thing WWE might want to do. Instead of the the drugs rehab, <laughs> they may want to do like a sexual offender rehab where you go in there and spend 30 days there, 45, <laughs> and you get out. I guess they give you a certificate or whatever. But, but the wrestling business is no different than anybody else. We all have problems that get magnified and highlighted because of the public profile. And everybody knows who Vince McMahon is. Everybody knows who the wrestlers are. Whether you follow wrestling or not, you've had to be surfing across your TV and, and run across one of the shows. So you know it's there. So when they say a professional wrestler for WWE, well, that makes you aware that there's there's a wrestling company out there, and so when he's somebody's involved with touching, you know, illicit touching or whatever, they would call that as a sex offense. You know, people become aware of that. So, but wrestling is no different than lawyers, no different than truck drivers or or anybody else. We all have certain things that we shouldn't do, and certain things that we 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 do. And I think everybody has that. But with a wrestler somehow, some way, with the internet and everybody being an expert, it gets magnified 10 times of what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, as per your point before as well, Vince McMahon is also believed that he wants to make a comeback to WWE. He's seen all these storylines that make sense now. And he just said, we, we can't have that, pal. And uh, well, yeah. I think he said he wasn't going to pay those women because he's already paid them one time. He, he made a settlement with Chatterton, didn't he? I don't think he did, no. But, Not with Chatterton. I think he did. I may be wrong, but that's one of those NDAs that if they did settle, she would have to sign. So if this was my question about the other women in WWE recently about all that, uh, that he paid all this money to. They signed NDAs. So if they released the details of that, wouldn't they be in violation of of their, ND, their own NDA? 
Well, it depends on who released the information because it's not out of the question because paperwork and a paper trail exists that someone within the company has found these NDAs and then released them, not the person who signed it. Well, then somebody would be in violation of something. Well, the only person who can't disclose is the person who signed it. So if some third party not related to either the alleged victim or the alleged perpetrator finds this paperwork and then somehow gets it out into the ether or to the Wall Street Journal, then uh, the person who signed the NDA wouldn't be in violation. Well, now we know why lawyers make so much money. Because they sit around and they just talk back and forth and back and forth. And then they got to take it in front of a judge and he makes the decision. So... But I think Vince, he misses it. He misses actually being the power. And I, I, don't, I don't begrudge him the right of missing it. But all these, like he's saying, the, the chickens came home to roost. So now he's caught between here and there, and he can't go either way. And I don't think he can go back and assume any power in WWE, even though it's, I think, it's perceived that he owns 80% of the voting shares. Uh, him and the rest of the McMahon family do. Uh, Vince, on his own, I don't believe does. But, I mean, if you can imagine that he turns back up and says, right, oh, I've changed my mind, I'm coming back. And, I mean, the entire board would just get up and leave, surely. Because, I mean, even as an example, just uh, with the Wall Street Journal, uh, I'll give you the quote here. Vince McMahon, 77-year-old Vince McMahon, also told people that he intends to make a comeback at WWE, according to people familiar with his comments. He has said that he received bad advice from people close to him and to step down, and that he now believes the allegations and investigations would have blown over if he had stayed, these people say. And when this comment came out, when this story broke, the WWE stock dropped from $76.01 to $73.73. So uh, Wall Street are not happy about the idea of Vince returning. Well, I disagree with uh, with Vince's <clears throat> assumption that if he hadn't stepped down, it would have went away on its own. I don't think so. I think because he had people shooting at him from inside the company and they w were not going to allow it to go away. <clears throat> Namely in point, I think Nick Khan. I think Nick Khan was actually sent in there to get to do away with Vince. I think Nick Khan was the one who leaked the information. Of course, that's just what the only one I can figure out. And it doesn't matter who leaked it, but he was in there and all of a sudden it shows up in the Times. And who else would leak, who else would have uh, the ability to even have access to those files? Triple H, yeah. Stephanie. Kevin Dull well, and I don't, a few others. Well, I'm not putting it past them to aren't no one Vince. He could say, hey, leak it if you want to. I think he would do, he would take the fall if it, if it would help Stephanie. I think. And I don't know what happened with him and his son. They fell out and he's gone. Where did he go? He's just he's just disappeared. He was there at the beginning of the year. I think he left or was ousted from the company at Royal Rumble because he was getting too big for his boots, I think the story was, and he was bossing people about or trying to tell people what to do, and Vince didn't like it and just said, get out, and he wasn't seen, he's not been seen since. <laughs> Brother, that's a dysfunctional family. Hmm. I would, I don't know. The McMahons, that would be a great sitcom on TV. If you could just base something around them. And, and Vince, what a character he was. Vince had more heat than any heel that I've seen in the last probably 30 years. All he would have to do was walk to the ring and do that walk. You know, and he would <laughs> strut down there. And people literally, you know, disliked him. But he was entertaining at the same time. And when he ran up against Stone Cold Steve Austin, we know the success that had. And Austin was that uncontrollable employee that wasn't going to take crap from his boss. And Vince was always figuring ways to try to screw him over. It was, 
the road runner and Bugs Bunny, I guess. Was, <laughs> Wiley Coyote. And, oh, Wiley Coyote. I, I get all that, those wrong anyway when I try to match people up. But very, very entertaining. And I, I've watched wrestling just about all my life. But people would watch the show just for that. So as long as they made that <clears throat> a really strong point in the show or at several points, that's why their their ratings were through the roof at the time, I think. Uh, one more thing I'll just uh, mention from the Vice TV show yesterday. Vince Russo said that Linda McMahon probably left Vince around 2012. During your Zeb Coulter run, did you ever see Linda at a show? No, oh, I did see her there. If she had left him, she just showed up a couple of times. I know I saw her in 2013 backstage, and I chatted with her for just a second. Did she you have know, an Linda's official pretty, role there, or was she just there? Well, I, th I, think she, I think she did. She had the same role she had before. And I know this was – I wasn't there in 2016 when, when Trump got elected. That's when she – she took the position on Trump's cabinet. Mm, small business administration czar or something like that, wasn't it? Yep. But I do know that she was there in 2013, 2014. And I never saw them together. But I didn't see any bad feelings between them. Because I think they were adult enough to say, we got this business to run. So let's just show everybody else. If we're not getting along... And I, ne I, ne I never saw that, but I never saw Vince with her or her with Vince or them talking or sitting or anything. But she was there when I was there. Uh, did you see Linda in the mid-90s during the Uncle Zebakaya run? No, I did see her there too. Not that much, because she didn't come that much. But I did see her around, especially pay-per-views, big pay-per-views. She would be there and... Was she still part of like the legal departments at that time, or I forgot. I don't think she was in the legal department. Actually, hell, I was just I was just trying to keep myself there. I wasn't worried about <laughs> it, anybody else what what she was doing. If they wanted me to know, they would tell me. And since nobody told me, I guess my knowledge wasn't wasn't needed. We will move on. And William Regal has been granted his release from AEW. Little is known still somehow about the contract. It was either one year or three years, or he was released early. That's all we know. Uh, Tony Khan recently said, I got a phone call, and it was saying that William Regal was approached by Mega Parekh, your favorite name from a few months ago. Uh, and it was all very legitimate, valid stuff. Basically, he's got a son who works at another wrestling promotion, and he really wanted us at the end of the year apparently that's what he said, when uh, we had the option to renew the contract. He was asking that we would not, nothing bad, we were having a great time working together, but this was an opportunity for him to get back and work in his golden years of his career with his son. So Regal has gone from yeah. AEW. Well, there was a lot of misinformation. That's, just, that's the word people like to use now. About He wasn't happy there from the beginning. They said he wasn't happy because he saw... Uh, what a mess it was backstage. <clears throat> and I and I can see that. I was at, T at TNA, and I saw a lot of messes. Nobody was really in charge, and I think might be the situation with Tony and the company and the executive vice presidents. Everybody thinks they're in charge of something, I guess. I, ca I can't speak with authority. But uh, Regal... I think his son is in the performance center in Orlando. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And he wants to help his son. And I don't blame him there either. And I think Tony was probably sympathetic with that wish, which I'm glad he was because now Regal can help his son and, and see what his son can do because he's got a great, he's got a great teacher and just his dad. So if you uh, listen to the rest of that, I mean, the guy may have a he may have a huge career in front of him. So, but you hear all these things about Tony Khan and that he is a big fan, and he is a big fan. So, but and he's playing with it. I don't know if he's playing with it. 
because he's put a couple hundred million dollars in that. So, well, his dad's money. Well, he's got money too. I don't know if he's got a couple hundred million dollars. No, but... I, no, I, I believe that his dad actually uh, came out and said, "Hey, look, you know why keep the money until I'm dead? Give the money to the some of the money to the kids. Let them have fun with it." So that's where the investment for AWs come from. Okay, well, and that's what he did. He likes wrestling. It's like almost a wrestling game, but with real wrestlers. But in looking at his show, there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, it has a lot of issues. But if he would work on that or if he would listen to anybody, one of my biggest uh, complaints about AEW is their interviews backstage. They look like a ninth grader shot it. No lights, <laughs> and they're talking about something you don't know what they're talking about. They don't take time to explain stuff. But if you just want to watch wrestling, it's a pretty decent wrestling show, really. They have some really, really good stuff on there. Uh, I'm going to bring up something as well. So they had Regal, or you know, this was known since almost probably like September that Regal was probably going to go. And I think Regal's going to be under contract until maybe the end of this year. And they had months to write Regal off television. So instead, what they do is, for no reason, Regal screws John Moxley uh, out of the uh, AEW Championship. And then the explanation was, Regal did a pre-tape interview from a couple of weeks ago and said, yeah, I was, I was teaching John Moxley a lesson. All right, see ya. And that was it. And, that's, and he's never going to be seen on TV again. And that was the enti uh, entire explanation. And... I've written the example here. It's like when The Rock was, uh, when WWF gave um, Jerry Lawler 24 hours to get rid of The Rock off TV, Ooh. he came up with a great storyline. And Jim Cornette, OVW, WWE issues as well, where they just take people out, you know, with two days' notice and you have to come up with a creative storyline. So why can't Tony Khan, he's got months, he had months to come up with something creative to write him off TV and then he didn't? Well, I don't know if he had months. He may have. But I think he's got a lot on his plate. He's booking four. He's booking three shows. He's booking uh, Dynamite, Rampage. He's doing one more, isn't he? Ring of Honor. Oh, he's Ring, booking Ring of Honor, but they don't have an outlet yet, right? They will be having it soon. I didn't even write this down in the news. So he boasted, "Oh, we're we'll, we're gonna have some distribution soon," and it turns out Ring of Honor's distribution is on Ring of Honor's Honor Club, which. What is that? Well, it's like their version of the WWE Network, and I can't imagine many thousands of people subscribe to it. Well, see, Ring of Honor, to me, I never really watched it. Ring of Honor had the one announcer, right? Kevin Kelly? For a long time? Yeah, I think so, yeah. I'm trying to remember the show. It was badly lit. I remember that. Well, it did look, it, it did look like it was all, it was recorded, taped in a high school gym. And again, the production qualities of it was bad, which a lot of stations would turn it down just on that. If it's not produced well, they won't have it on their show. And that's the difference between AEW and WWE. You look at WWE, it's like a, a Broadway musical. I mean, they don't miss anything. You got the lights and the music and coming down the aisle and the shots and the spotlights and this and the announcers. But in AEW, they just, hell, they open up sometimes with a match in the ring, which I kind of like sometimes. But give me the cold open. Uh, but sometimes you don't even get that. A lot of difference between the two shows, but I do think both of Tony's shows could be vastly improved if he would just made a made a few corrections. Uh, one more thing to mention is that Regal's deal to get out of his uh, AW contract early was that he'd go to WWE and work in a backstage capacity only. He couldn't be on TV. Um, speaking of WWE, we're going to mention this as well. Sasha Banks looks unlikely to be returning to WWE. And various reports have stated that Sasha Banks is expected to be at New Japan Pro Wrestling's Wrestle Kingdom event, Tokyo Dome, January 4th, 2023. Voices of Wrestling claim that Banks' per appearance deal will be the highest price that parent company Bushy Road has ever 
paid anyone, and that includes Chris Jericho, who was receiving $100,000 per appearance. W- why? Well, first of all, I don't believe it. <laughs> I really don't. I, I couldn't believe it. Why, why would you pay dollars $100,000. I don't... Why would you... Why, you think she's going to make... Okay, to pay... Uh, to pay this... This is the rule of thumb that, and I'm sure it has been discarded now, but maybe not. To pay somebody $100,000, that means that she would have to produce $300,000 in, in sales for the show. You think she'll do that? No. I don't is think she'll sell a single extra ticket. Well, I don't need it really. Oh, she'll sell a few extra tickets, but I don't think it's, I don't believe the $100,000. I actually don't believe the $100,000 with, with uh, Jericho either. Could be true. I could be. I believe it was because true. You, and I also believe he but, was underpaid you, because he did generate a lot of income for like, he had a few matches with Kenny Omega that did um, big business. Well, they're doing big business. That's one thing. But $100,000 for one match is still a lot of money for that one appearance. But if he can get it, more power to him. I hope he did get it. But if somebody come up with me $100,000, I said, I will cut my arm off. (laughs) (laughs) Right there on TV, $100,000. But let me have the check first. So... And then I wouldn't really cut my arm off. I'd just get a little blood and I'd, I'd run out. I'd run out. I'd run out the door. But no, I don't think they're giving her a hundred thousand dollars. That's very, very hard for me to believe. So mark me down on the non believer list. I don't blame you as well. Uh, it's been, well, I don't understand how Sasha Banks walks out on a valid WWE contract. Now, WWE can freeze this contract. So why would they let her out of a valid contract? to walk off to, not com- not competition, New Japan, but, um, you know, a rival wrestling promotion, let them make a huge payday, probably get even more unhappy with a WWE contract, and I don't get it. Why would they, why would they let her out in the first place? I don't know. I, that, I don't, I'm going back to my reporter remark I made at the start of the show. We'd make hellacious reporters. Because <laughs> we... We don't know nothing. <laughs> We're just saying, I don't believe that crap. I don't believe that shit. No, they ain't doing that. But I, I don't know. I have, I have no idea. I don't have an answer. I don't have nothing to that. But I also heard she was making $30,000 just on the, you know, the, like the Russell, Russell Con, you know, Comic Con business. Really? Well, she shows up. She just signs a bunch of pictures and stuff. And those pictures are very expensive. I got that. But I I, I don't know. $30,000 is a lot of money for just a, a one little appearance, a two-hour appearance to sell pictures and photographs, photo ops. But I don't know how much they are. They could be 500 bucks. Yeah, even The Undertaker wouldn't charge or Hulk Hogan wouldn't charge that much. Well, I don't know what Hogan gets or uh, Undertaker gets, but I think it is in the. And I do know that Stone Cold, and this was years ago, he was doing twenty grand to show up, and Undertaker would probably be more. Hogan Taker was three hundred. Uh, Hogan was three hundred a few months ago, or whatever, just to go to a speed shop in 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 Florida. Wait a minute, three hundred thousand? No, 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 no. This picture, is sorry. Uh, he, he was charging fans three hundred dollars per for a photo and a signature. Well, you would go to his place in Florida, and you get to you have a little meet and greet with him, the family. Three hundred dollars. I can kind of see that because then you have your picture made. You're in his place in Florida. You know, you're all hugged up. You're all big buddies. You can hang the picture. I can I can see that. But to give Sasha Banks thirty thousand dollars and you just get a little bit shot of her, 100. then you're gone. A hundred, a hundred, a hundred on the show. Yeah, sorry, I'm talking about the thirty on the mm-hmm. on the conventions. Hey, I don't know. 
<laughs> I don't I don't really do conventions much anymore. Actually, good business, really, but it's kind of hard to get to them and. Well, there's plenty. Of, yeah, there's plenty of them about though. So uh, if you pick and choose your shots, uh, we'll ask a few more bits of news, then we'll shut down the podcast. And you alluded to alluded, if I can say, alluded to this earlier. Uh, WWE Raw is posting record tying low viewership numbers. Um, the week before, as we record this, on the fifth, one point two six million in the third hour, an all time low, and twelve twelve one point four seven average. Uh, sorry, that was for a single hour, and twelve twelve one point four seven average, tied for the lowest raw rating ever as well. Rampage is hitting all time lows, three hundred sixty one thousand on the second of December. SmackDown is doing quite well. Now, I imagine that obviously Raw is going against NFL. And yes. uh, is three hours and is a heck of a commitment, especially on a Monday night when you've got work the next day. Rampage uh, is a different kettle of fish, less competition. Rampage, I think, at 10 o'clock at night on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. That's a that's an issue with them. That's like, that's when the news comes on. That's when a lot of things, I, I don't know what else is going on. But only hitting 300,000, I mean, TNA in their first in their first show, I keep talking about TNA, but that was a secondary, for those of you who don't know what TNA was, it was uh, the competition to WWE. TNA called it a war. WWE didn't even know a war was going on. <laughs> <laughs> So you can't have a war unless one side knows what is going on. But they did 300,000, and they were really, really disappointed in it. I was kind of disappointed in it, too, because I don't. But it's 300,000. Now it's beating Rampage. It was beating Rampage, and, and that's when TNA first started. And they were on, like, the Fox, like, FS1 or something, one of the, the substitute channels wasn't even on the main channel, but it still did 300,000 people, <clears throat> fans, and they were disappointed in it. Now, uh, I guess Rampage is doing the same thing, but on a, what channel are they on? They're on TNT? TNT or TBS, one or the other. Well, they're on TNT, and which is a major channel by now. But they were doing a lot better back in a year ago, a lot better. But you're talking about SmackDown. SmackDown is doing better because it's a better show. I think that that was the one. How much does Triple H have to do with the booking of Raw? I would suspect he's, I don't know. I mean, surely he's got to sign off on both Raw and SmackDown, hasn't he? But I think he's more involved in SmackDown that for some reason. That wouldn't surprise me. And... And I did SmackDown for up to four months ago, I guess, when all these changes happened. But before, I mean, going past that four months, I swear to God, the show was just awful. <laughs> Nothing happened. You could almost predict what segments certain talents would come out. It was almost like it was set in stone. Of course, they always do that, but not later. They always do that in ring to start the show. Actually, SmackDown started by just having a match. And then they would do the in ring, which I, I kind of I kind of believe in shaking it up a little bit. But SmackDown now, you got Bray Wyatt, and, you, and then you got the Roman thing and the Sami Zayn thing working, and, and the girls are trying to regroup and, and come back around. But SmackDown's a, a more actually, uh, and it's two hours. I think that extra hour kicks your ass. Two hours of wrestling is enough. Like if I watch a football game and it's three hours and a half, I'm going, God, let's do it. Quit calling the timeouts. Let's go. Let's, just give me a winner is what I want. Give me a winner and a loser and let's go. But that extra hour, I mean, it's hard to hold people for that extra hour. And that extra hour, if it drops, it brings your whole show down. Of course, they know this. I mean, I'm not telling them or any of the viewers listening something that they don't know, but it's hard to book a three-hour show. And I've said this before. If I watch a movie, it's three hours. 
If I see that it's three hours before I watch it, I'm not watching it. You know, two hours and a half, two hours, 15, two hours is about my max. Two hours, okay, I can, I can enjoy it and get up and, and walk away. Three hours, I can't do it. But they know that, but they make so much money on that extra hour, they're not uh, inclined to, you know, get out of it. Uh, you've watched Rampage. I don't know if you've watched it from the absolute beginning, but you've watched it for, you know, a good year at least, every episode. What's changed with it and what's driving fans away from that show in particular? It's it's kind of boring, to tell you the truth. You used to quite like it when you first talked about it, when I, you were first I, reviewing it, Sports Kid. You quite liked it. It was bang, well, bang, bang, one hour done, and now it's boring. Well, it's kind of boring now. Hey, shows, shows go up and down. It used to be pretty good because that's when they had their characters over. And But I think what's, what's happening now, I think we have Booker fatigue. I don't think Tony is quite sure what he wants. Now, I hear that he books all the shows. I don't think he books all the shows. I think he might make out the skeleton list. And then when they think about it, then they get to the show and they figure it out. But I don't think he has many long range plans or doesn't look like to me, but he was just sitting in really a sweet spot when the CM Punk thing happened right before that, before that scrum. Mm -hmm. And that's, that, that was a scrum that they haven't recovered from it yet because the scrum and the fight backstage took precedent. Of course, of course, CM Punk was off the air. The Bucks were off the air. Omega was off the air. And so when you're punishing yourself and the talent, that's punishing the fans too. So they just tuned out, I think. Now, I may be wrong, but a lot of people start watching and some people don't. Something has to, for people to watch, they got to enjoy something. They got to buy into it and support it. And I think when that scrum happened and they didn't quite understand that, you know, the executive vice president, I don't think people really understood that because I think you, you should have your administrative, you know, your Tony Khans, and then you should have all the talents underneath that that are all vying for championships. And you can understand that, even though it's a, it's a scripted series, you can understand that. But when you start putting the talent up with the executives, the executive branch, then the people go, I don't quite understand it. I don't know if they think that much about it, but it, to me, if I'm thinking about it right now, I'm confused. I think, um, as far as I can tell, if you book a show like a B show, you can't expect people to be interested in it. Well, again, it's going to what you're going to bring up your A show to put on there. So he's got 183 talents I've, I've heard. I don't care. You could have 10, you could have seven or eight shows and not use 183 talents. I don't get it. What's, what's the roster, the, the smallest roster in the territories that you worked on? I mean, 16, 14? 14. 14, 16. Mm -hmm. And everything runs smooth. It ran smooth because, you know, you, Sometimes less is more. So we did a 90-minute show in Memphis that was converted down to an hour show for the loop for the Louisville's and the Evansville and the Nashville's or the secondary, not the secondary towns, but the, the secondary showing of the tape. <clears throat> and we worked it with 14 to 16 uh, talents sometimes 18, but when it got to 18, it got crowded because the more people on that talent meant, you know what it meant? Less pay because you had to figure in two more talents to pay, even though they were paid uh, preliminary sums. Still, it took, it took from the, from the total. And sometimes, you know, what are you going to do with these, these guys that the people haven't seen on TV? They, they just, that's where the term jobber came from. Because every time you saw them on TV, they're just getting the shit kicked out of them. But 
but that was probably the lowest. Puerto Rico had about 14. I never had 16 or 18 guys to work with. Now, on big shows, I would increase it. To make it look more like a big show, you'd have more matches. So the people say, well, it's a big show. They got this, 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 and, you know, and it looks like a big show if you just see the, if you just see the advertisement for it. So but I think when you get past that 20 mark, it's kind of hard to, it's kind of hard to book it and keep it together. Because some of those guys are going to be on TV for, what, five minutes? Yeah. You're going to beat them and they're going to go. They don't make any kind of an impact or anything. So how are you going to book this guy going forward? You got to tell a story. And I'm going to tell this story while we, while we're here. Did you, did you get that tweet I put out about, do the people remember Jack Hart in Florida? Ah, we're going to talk about that in the next episode. I've already, oh, okay. I've already, I've already got it written. So uh, we'll mention Jack Hart in the next episode for now. Uh, I think we've probably maybe got, Time for two more quick ones. Uh, Pro Wrestling Illustrated named its top three tag teams of 2022. Number one were the Usos. Number two was FTR. And number three was the Briscoe Brothers. Do you agree? And if you don't, who would be in your top three? No, I, I kind of agree with that, I think. I think all these are really, really good teams. I really like the, the Usos, and I really, really like uh, the Briscoes. Because I think the Usos bring some of the old school with them because they were taught by the old school. The Briscoes definitely bring the old school with them. And I like the way they look, too. They just look, got a great look. Yeah, they look like wrestlers, not like models, like, uh, you know, the, uh, pluck a name Cody, that kind of thing when he was young. And I like uh, uh, I like their gimmick. They're like northern rednecks. <laughs> they come off a farm somewhere up in Delaware or something. But... And good guys. I think the people can identify with them. And FTR, good team. But I do think they toot their own horn just a little bit too much. They want to be known, not for making money, but as the greatest tag team of, of all time. I mean, if you can say that, that's fine. And they are a good team. But, but I would agree with those three teams. Would you have anybody you would put in there? No, that seems pretty fair to me. Uh, did you ever try and get the Briscoe brothers over to TNA? No, they were they were with the Ring of Honor, and it was hard to hard to work with any other groups in those days. I think they were they were like the company, not them. The company was Leary uh, pissing off WWE, and Ring of Honor started working with TNA. That would that would uh, tarnish their their friendship with WWE. And I don't think they used any at all, really, a back and forth WWE guys on Ring of Honor shows, did they? I, off the top of my head, I don't know. I think, I, I think Mark and Jay just like living where they live. and They don't want to do the touring or anything. Well, I did bring them. I, I brought them to Puerto Rico. I did, I did bring them there one time. But it was only like for a three-day run. You know, it was anniversary week. I brought them down. And that's when I kind of got to know them a little better. But I like those guys. Uh, there's two more things I can ask you. We're going to leave the John Cena thing. We can leave that for a couple of weeks. Um, either the Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame or the Jim Ross, John Laurinaitis comments. What would you rather me ask you? The Laurinaitis Oh, right. So you've definitely got an answer for that one then, have you? <laughs> uh, well, I, the, the other one, I don't know hardly any of those guys. No, I don't know. I'll tell you what, let me, I'll quickly read through them and I'll leave it out. Uh, Holy Demon Army, Toshiaki Kawada and Akira Tao. Uh, these are Hall of Fame, Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame uh, inductees. Uh, Ibushi, Naito, Mystico, aka Sankara, and also uh, Los Vianos family. British wrestling legend Mark Rollerball Rocco, who I think is great. And also Johnny Doyle and Lou Darrow. They were promoters based in Los Angeles. Who were the promoters in Los Angeles? Uh, Lou Darrow, and I've lost his name already, goodness me, and Johnny Doyle. 
Uh, never, uh, ne- never heard of him. Yeah, we're talking from the twenties to the sixties. There, I think. So uh, Johnny Doyle uh, eventually ended up teaming See, up with th- uh, Barnett to start World Championship Wrestling in Australia. This appeals to those hardcore fans, which no, no slight or no, you know, slight on them, but most of the fans, like me, or casual fans. And I have no idea who those Japanese guys are. Now, what is that word you use? Takanoto or what? Takashido? Or? Uh, he was Tosh- uh, Toshiaki I call, Kawada. I call him Takashita. That's what I call <laughs> him. That's what it looks like. But I have no idea. Unless, but I saw him on, on Rampage. Huh. Great talent. And that's the only way that people are going to get to know any of these guys in the U.S. unless you follow Japanese wrestling. And I don't know what their following is in this country, but I don't know them. But it's okay for me not to know them because I'm, I, I don't follow wrestling that much anymore unless I'm watching SmackDown or Rampage. I kind of watch that. And that one guy on there, I, I knew him only only through the Rampage show. But that appeals to the hardcore fans, and uh, it, it wouldn't even include me. So they in the, the, the Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame? Yes, uh, they were voted in um, by so Meltzer, historians, current and, pre- and uh, past wrestlers. Well, who, who were they voted in by? Oh, that, those, those four. There's like a giant, hundreds of people out there who put votes in for these guys between journalists, historians, current wrestlers, inactive wrestlers. Well, historians in wrestling, you want to reach over and slap them <laughs> because no matter what you say, it's going to be wrong because they read in Meltzer's deal that so-and-so helping, you know, history is written by the winners. So, and who has the last say on a subject that can be adopted as, you know, stone cold truth whether it is or not. And you know, as we're talking about reporters here, we don't know, we don't know. I think Melcher should add that to a lot of his comments too, a lot of his reports. Well, I don't know, really know, but he can't do that because people think he is the last word, whether anything is true in the world of professional wrestling. And sometimes knowing the truth, as I say, shall set you free. I don't think... I think about half of what Meltzer says, he just kind of makes up for lack of knowledge because he's got to have something to like end the story and he'll just put it down. Wait, so go- I may be, I may be wrong, which I am a lot, but I, I will admit that. But I, I think we've ahead. established that we'd be terrible reporters and we'd also be terrible doctors as well. <laughs> Uh, I think I'd be a, I think I'd be a better doctor because <laughs> I would like to dispense some of those drugs that are banned on WWE list. Yeah, I just load them. I just load them up with it. Here, take this. You'll feel better. Yeah. Rehab, rehab facility. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. The, the warm sunshine. I will ask you this uh, very quickly via Grilling Jr. podcast. Jim Ross said of John Laurinaitis, "I had a hard time as time went on trusting Laurinaitis." That's sad to say. I hired him. I gave him a job when he needed it. I don't think he treated me quite right. He just wanted to show Vince that he was a better manager than JR and all these things. So now his ass is without a job and he deserves the goddamn misery that he's living, that I perceive that he's living, (laughs) and I didn't like how he treated me. So uh, even for Jim Ross, that's pretty stinging. Tell us how you feel, Jim. Don't hold it, but don't, don't hold back on it. Now, Laurinaitis, he's a nobody could trust him. You could tell by just talking to him. You know, because you could talk to some guys and you know, kind of give them a just a just a little bit of a, a little bit of trust. Laurinaitis, you couldn't even do that. You have to watch what you say around him. Watch what, because all he's doing is is going back and. He's just reporting directly back to Vince. And whatever Vince's temperature on a situation is will be his temperature. He'll just add a little more to it to make Vince feel like, well, 
you had it right the first time. So <clears throat> Jr. talks very seldomly about people that he doesn't like. Uh, and this right here kind of surprised me that he talked about Lord Nottis in such a way. Because, you know, he'll, ma he'll make everything sound like, well, yeah, we're not really that close, but I respect him. There's no doubt that he doesn't respect Lord Nottis for that last comment you made. So if he's, if he's out of the loop, yeah, I agree with Jim. He kind of, he kind of deserves it because – of course, I've heard some stories about Laurinaitis and the girls up there and in uh, WWE. And and some of those girls are really, really nice girls. They've never, of course, they've been around guys, but they've never been around a dressing room, you know, with, with wrestlers. And the vibe is different. They're trying to fit in. They're trying to get people to like them, especially management. And he was trying to take advantage of that, which I have no respect for him at all. If that was my daughter or my sister, or I, I'd, I'd get pissed off. So, but sometimes they say karma doesn't forget an address. Hmm. And karma came back and revisited Mr. Laurinaitis. Uh, you've said before how, and we apparently know how, John Laurinaitis sort of maybe took advantage of his position when it came to the lady uh, wrestlers and some of the office staff as well, probably. But how would he sort of upset the apple cart when it came to the uh, men or even Jim Ross or other office staff like that? What would he do to... Why does Jim Ross hate him so much, specifically? Well, because he, he probably backstabbed him. That's what he did. He went to the office with Vince, and JR wasn't there all the time. But Laurinaitis was in that office, and with Vince... Almost every day, or he was in contact with Vince every day of the year. Even the holidays, they'd probably make a call back and forth. Vince saying, well, did you take care of this? Did you take care of that? Oh, yeah, boss. Oh, yeah, I got it, got it, got it. And I'm not saying that that's what happened. But I think he buried uh, Jim. And in, in what, in what Larnice was doing, he was, he was padding his resume that he was the best man for the job. I don't care what it was. He actually took over the job of talent relations from the guy who got fired, Carano, Mark Carano. And he was in charge of talent relations before, which was one of the worst jobs he could have had because that brought him face to face with the girls alone, working out a contract or working out this or working out that. Now, I'm not saying that happened. But I have heard stories from the girls themselves that painted Mr. Laurinaitis in a bad light. What's the difference between... Did, did I say anything to him? No, I did not, because it wasn't my place. They don't say, stay in your lane. You better stay in your lane in WWE. Or guess what? You'll be driving in the ditch. You won't have a lane to stay in if you upset too many people. What's the difference between sort of horn dog and coercive predator? in this instance, do you think? Say that again. What's the difference between well, what? Well, it, it, seems like, it seems like there's a, a sort of thin line between someone who's just a, a randy person who just loves the ladies and then there's somebody who's just coercive and using their position of power to put people in very bad positions. I would say it's a very thin line. And that line can be crossed several times actually in one interview according to how it's received but I got my thoughts about him and I never I, I try to like everybody I try to find some good in them and I didn't really dislike him but I'd heard so many like sleazy things about him that it kind of prejudiced my views on him. You like that word prejudiced? I, I just thought I'd throw that in there. But sometimes, you know, you judge people by what you hear, whether they're by whether they're true or not. Because when there's smoke, there's fire somewhere. That old saying. I'm bringing a lot of old sayings in here today. But uh, and he he tried to take credit for all these long, detailed, drawn out finishes that they finally ended up bringing to WWE. 
I guess he he could have he could have started them, uh, but he got credit for it. But but I never heard of him drawing a ton of money in Japan. You, who who did you interview the other day? Who uh, Shane Douglas? I did. Yeah, Shane Douglas used to be his partner. He did. What did dynamic, Shane say about it? Dynamic dudes. Uh, I think he still likes him and everything. But uh, man, I'd have to. I don't know. I'd ha- I'd have to rewatch it because I've already forgot. Uh, I don't even think I asked about Johnny Ace this last time. It was uh, the time before. There's a couple of videos out, but uh, uh, Mrs. Again, Bapper you loved would him. be. You would be the shits as a reporter. I know. I know. You I say, never claimed to hey, be a reporter. And you say, six months ago, when I, interviewed, I didn't ask you about this. You know, and he <laughs> said, oh, yeah. But anyway. <laughs> but I don't think Lauren Addis was really well respected by the majority of the talent backstage. Top guys kind of hated him. I'm not going to name any names. And the top guys hated him because – they could tell by Vince's reaction to them who had talked to them. And of course, if Vince was a little cool to them or they would have, they would just naturally shift that uh, guilt over to Laurinaitis, whether he was guilty or not. So he actually put himself in a worse role. And we usually call them stooges. Every office had one. It was like, like if you wanted so yeah, if you had something you didn't want the boss to know, you didn't let this guy know. Because he'd stewed you off. A tattle so I think that that was that was I think the that was the situation with John. Dutch I whether would, it's, is whether it's true or not, I don't know. Dutch, I would never stooge you off in a million years. Uh I well, th- well thank you. <laughs> I am going to shut down this podcast now. The bo- oh hang on. We're going to advertise the books again just because it's near Christmas. Uh, if you're on Prime, you can get them in time for Christmas. Owen Hart, King of Pranks, written by me. The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, the People's Champion, written by me as well. And two books by Dutch as well. You can get them on Amazon Prime, but I'm sure you'd much rather have them signed by the man himself. And to do that, you go to... You go to Dirty Dutch Man's Tale, with two L's, at uh, gmail.com. Just ask for information, and I'll get right back to you. There you go, then. If you enjoy this podcast, please give us five stars on iTunes or wherever else you give five stars. You know, throw them out like Meltzer does. Give us some nice five-star reviews. We need some. But for now, thank you very much for watching. Thank you, Dutch Friends. And us. Mr. Jack Swagger, Jake Hager, as he's known now, will be joining us in a couple of weeks, and we're going to talk about some of the horrifying things we ran into on the road while we were in WWE. Mm. Wow, that's a teaser that I didn't know was coming. I'm I'm more excited for this interview than anyone now. Well, there's a couple of times that Jack almost got us killed. And then, uh, well, I got to get him in here. And so we'll start, you know, pumping each other's brains. And then one story will lead to another story. Then it will lead to another story and another story. Uh, But I will say one thing about Jack. Probably the most fun I've ever had in the wrestling business I had with Jack, traveling around with him. Very intelligent guy, uh, young, willing to learn, willing to ask me. And uh, but and he helped me a lot because at the time, hell, I wasn't young when I went to WWE. I needed help. He would help me do a bunch of stuff of which I needed. Without Jack, I don't think I would have made it two months. Because it was just, it was, it was, it's physically demanding. Even just traveling between the towns. And Jack always kept me there on time. And, and I, I really enjoyed my time with him. But you'll hear about it, uh, not next week, but maybe the week after, the week after that. We'll give you plenty of time. Yep. I'll be tweeting about it. Yep, there'll be uh, plenty of time to get excited. So that'll cure some of the uh, post Christmas blues as well. But for now, thank you very much for watching. Thank you, Dutch. <laughs> we the people. We, the people.